Well, I'm going to um, turn to the actual subject today. Um, oh, I want to point this out because uh, I have a lot of notes today. So um, we do have a U version where you can get all the notes. If you also want my notes after the fact, you can email me at craig at theheartcda.com. But um, there's quite a few notes. And if you just go there, you click the U version app. If you have that, click on the more and then the events tab, you can find my notes for today. So um, today we are... <sighs> Raise your hand if you have been to the sound before. Raise your hand if you've never been to the sound before. Raise your hand if you have no idea what I mean when I say the sound. <laughs> wow, okay. All right, so here's where we're at, friends. Next weekend, I can promise you this room will be full. <laughs> okay. I know that like for churches, like the Super Bowl is like Easter and Christmas, but I'm just telling you at Heart of the City Church, the Super Bowl is the sound. Like if you don't show up early, you may not get a seat or you'll be sitting out in the lobby. So usually we have about 3000 people come out on sound weekends. So what it is, is uh, we've been fasting and praying all month, consecrating ourselves to the Lord, which is to set ourselves apart for his work and purpose, to position ourselves in a place where he can do in us what he desires to do. And we do that to, set our, uh, to position ourselves for the Lord for the whole year, but in many ways specifically for Sound Weekend, which is our next weekend conference. Uh, we're starting on Friday night at 7.07 p.m. and then uh, Saturday night, 6.06 here, and then both campuses on Sunday. But we have guest speakers coming in. They're prophetically gifted people, and they're gonna speak for a little while, and then they're just gonna speak life and prophecy into our congregation. And so it's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing. It's a... Uh, uh, people come out from other churches and I'm just telling you, you're going to want to come early and you're going to want to be here because it's a, it's a powerful experience. And um, today what I'm here to do is to talk to you about prophecy. Because even as I looked around and saw your hands going up, I would, I would imagine that there are many people in this room that don't have any idea really of what prophecy is, or maybe you've heard about it. You've, 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 you know about it from the Bible a little bit. You know that there are people called prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, but maybe you don't know much about how it works or how it should work. Um, and so I just know that there's a spectrum in this room or, or online where, with where people are at in regards to this subject. And so uh, we're going to talk about prophecy today, and I'm going to do my best to give you like a 101 course from the Old Testament and the New Testament as to what it is, what it was in the Old Testament, what it is now, and what it's meant to be for us today. Amen? All right, this is what, if you have a Bible, turn, we're gonna start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's not gonna be on the screen, so um, either pull it up in your, in your phone or turn in the page or just listen to me. If you would, would you just stand for this scripture reading? Now, this is a letter written to the church in Corinth, which if you don't know, basically there was, it was, a, it was a, it's basically this port city right between the northern part of Greece and the southern part of Greece. And it, it was a place where ships would go back and forth between the east and the west. And in about 44 BC, the Romans destroyed this city and everybody was scattered. And then they really wanted to reestablish the city, but it was in ruins and nobody wanted to go there. So the Romans started paying people and giving people free land to move there. And they got a lot of old soldiers to move there and a lot of sailors would pass through there. And basically the reason why you've heard of Corinth being such a sort of a nasty, terrible place is for that reason. Now, a lot of people would point, point out to the issues that Paul speaks about to the church and how some of these issues are to do with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And some people, some even Bible teachers would say, oh, it's because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the pursuit of those that the church was so unhealthy. But really it's because the city was really unhealthy and really unhealthy people got saved and put in the church. But just so you know, the city was full of prostitution. It was full of drinking. In fact, there was even a saying in the entire area that if you were a Corinthian, they would, they would call people Corinthians as like a bad name. Oh, you're a Corinthian, which means you're a drunkard or you're sexually devious. 
Like this was the city that this church was planted in. And so they were kind of jacked up people, but they were jacked up people that got saved and experienced the Holy Spirit. And so some correction needed to be brought and really correction needs to be brought to us as well. And this, this particular place is coming right after 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about love being primary. You've heard it at weddings before. And this is how he continues. He says, pursue love and earnestly desire Hello, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. I know there's lots of things that you desire in your life, but the urging of the scripture is that we would earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Watch this, especially that you may prophesy. So if there are Bible teachers that you're listening to online that say the gifts aren't for today, well, I just, I don't know. It it sounds to me like we're supposed to desire all of them, especially one of them that we might prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue or in tongues speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. Maybe you've wondered about that gift, speaking in tongues. You may have heard people speaking in tongues. Well, you're you're not gonna understand them. They're speaking to God, maybe a heavenly angelic language. Now it can be interpreted, but not always. That's not always the purpose of it. Nevertheless, that gift is between a person and God primarily. But on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, for their encouragement and for their consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. That's why we do the sound conference to build up the church, that's you. We bring in prophets to prophesy over you to build you up. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets. Why? So that the church may be built up. And he goes on to talk about that exact thing because it's all about the church being built up. So let's jump into it today. Lord, I thank you again for your presence in this room. And right now I just declare, nobody came here to hear me speak. We came here, all of us to hear you speak. And so we declare no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is allowed in this room. We don't just invite you into the room. We give you the whole room and we say, whatever it is that you want to say, whatever your truth is from scripture, whatever your spirit wants to speak to us as individuals, as families, and as a church congregation, we say, have your way, let your kingdom come and your will be done in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you and you may have a seat. He says this as he starts this section, teaching about the spiritual gifts. He kind of starts this section in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. And so he goes on this whole thing about spiritual gifts in, in chapter 12. And then he, he sort of sandwiches this whole thing about love right there in the middle, because if we have not love, none of the spiritual gifts matters. It, if, you, if you speak in tongues, good for you. But if you speak nasty to men, then your tongues don't matter. Like we need to love people, right? And so, but... There is, there is a need for this church because they were uninformed in regards to what it was that they were experiencing and in regards to the truth of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so he didn't want them to be uninformed and we don't want you to be uninformed. I just wanna confess to you right here off the, off the bat, when I showed up to Heart of the City Church, I did not show up as a charismatic. Okay? I showed up as a very conservative very judgmental, very standoffish, fully believing, fully loving God, fully believing in the scriptures, but a person that I didn't quite know what I thought about tongues and prophecy and healing and all of these quote unquote gifts of the spirit. That's just who I was at the time. And I tell you that for a few reasons. Number one, I just want you to know that if you're here and that's where you're at and you just don't know like what you think about all of these things or, or maybe you're just now being introduced to it today and, and you have no idea even what you're gonna experience today or next weekend and you might feel a little, a little uncomfortable or, or just unaware, I just want you to know you're in the right place. You're good. 
Can I just encourage you this? Even if you're a little skeptical, that's all good. I just wanna encourage you to show up today, right now, and to show up next weekend with a heart that would say, God, whatever is from you, I want it. Even if I don't quite understand it. When the Holy Spirit was first poured out in Acts chapter two, there were some people that didn't understand and they wondered. There were some people that were amazed and there were some people that made fun of. I just wanna encourage you to, to, to tell your soul not to make fun of, but it's okay to question. And so I'm gonna do my best today in regards to this specific subject of prophecy to make sure that you're informed as best I can. So the title of this message today is Consecrated to Hear because we believe that God wants us to hear His voice and God wants to, us to hear directly for us. And the gift of prophecy is that we would hear from God and speak it to other people. So I'm just gonna preach a little different than I normally do. I'm gonna preach 10 points, starting with a definition and a premise. And then I got 10 points for you, which I think sort of encapsulates basically the entire Bible's opinion on prophecy. And so uh, if you have questions later, you can email me. All right, here's our definition today. And there probably could be little variances to this, but in case you just absolutely have no clue what I'm talking about, let's go with this. Prophecy is one's or somebody's ability to speak truth from the heart of God about the past, present, or future realities. In other words, if somebody is going to prophesy, they have to hear from God. They're not making it up. If they're making it up, it's not prophecy. Now, if you're making something up or you're coming up with something that's not bad or evil, it may be, if you're speaking something that's anti-biblical or against God or steering people astray. But if you're, if you're coming up with something that's, you're, you, you may be preaching, you might be a preacher, but specifically, now preachers can be prophetic, but specifically the gift of prophecy is to hear from God and to speak truth from God and from his heart about past, present, or future realities. That's my definition today, okay? Did you get that on the screen? There you go, there it is. That's the definition. Here's my premise, and then we're gonna start in my 10 points. And this is just really important because of the way that I know that people generally cast judgment on this gift is to do with this specific subject. And so the, the reason that I'm pointing out this specific pre premise is because it tends to be the issue in people's hearts. Here's the premise. There are differences between Old Testament and New Testament prophetic roles. And I'm gonna do my best today to present that to you, okay? 10 points. Number one, prophets in the Old Testament had a specific role. And here's the specific role. They were covenant enforcers. Okay, so not everybody in the Old Testament was a prophet and we don't even see evidence that everybody who was a follower of Yahweh even had the ability to be a prophet or to operate in prophetic gifting. Now we do know that there were times even in the Old Testament when the spirit of prophecy would fall or fill a person for a specific period of time like it did with Saul and he prophesied when he was amongst the prophets, but he was not a prophet nor did he operate in the gift any other time. Typically in the Old Testament, the prophets, their, their job was to enforce the covenant that God made with his people. And they did that in a few primary ways. And there, there's, again, probably some variances to this, but these are the primary ways that they operated. And so I wanna make this very clear to you. Number one, they were to inform people of God's will in a very general sense. This is why like a big chunk of your Bible is called the prophets, okay? so. A lot of the books that you're gonna read, like everything after Psalms and Proverbs is considered the, the prophets in the Old Testament. So Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and all, all of those in the minor prophets. And what they were doing is they were informing, they were being a mouthpiece or an oracle on behalf of God. So imagine if you're the president of the United States ambassador to a foreign country and he's not calling them, he's not speaking to them. You literally are taking the message and whatever it is that you say is as if the president is saying it. That's a weight upon your shoulders. You better make sure that you're speaking right, 
right? And so their job was to inform people of God's will. Number two, it was to proclaim the, the path of blessing in following God's will, or watch this, the path of consequence in not following God's commands. Now, unfortunately, we see this unfold often because the people in the Old Testament are just like you and I. They're kind of dumb sometimes. <laughs> because oftentimes we, we've been told what is true. We kind of know what is right, but we stray from that. And so we have to realize that who our God is, is not just this like supernatural killjoy that just has these rules that he's just kind of seeing if we'll follow the rules. And then he's just, if we, if we disobey him, he's just slamming us. No, that's not, our God is a good heavenly father and he has good things for us. And he knows that if we choose not to obey the good things that he's presented to us, that there are natural consequences that are gonna take place. And that a good father will inform his children of what those consequences are. And so we see it time and time again, the prophets oftentimes, they're all alone. They're, they're calling out to cities. They're calling out to God's people. They're saying, listen, God is asking you to repent. God is asking you to care for the poor. God is asking you to honor the Sabbath. God is asking you to give of your finances. God is asking you to love the widow and the orphan. God is asking you not to abuse people. Uh, many things. And if you, if you keep doing what you're doing, then there's gonna be consequences to you because Israel at the time was the symbol for the whole world to see who God was. They were God's son. They were the image of who Yahweh was, the revelation to the world of, of who God was. And if they wouldn't even walk in his, in his counsel and, and experience his blessings, then how is God gonna reveal himself to the rest of humanity through Abraham? And so surely he says, if you're not gonna represent me well and you're gonna worship other gods, there's gonna be consequences. And sometimes that meant that foreign armies would come in and take them out. And this is what prophets would do. They would, they would just simply proclaim, if you guys repent, if you humble yourself and you pray, God will restore you and heal your land. But if you don't, this is what's gonna happen. Number three, they would serve as counselors to kings and rulers. So remember Nathan, King David had sinned, was trying to get away with it. Nathan comes directly to the king and basically speaks a prophetic word from the Lord because he had revelation from God to the sin that nobody else knew about. And the prophet spoke to the king, brought repentance and restoration to his heart. And that happened many, many times. Number four, their job was to foretell future outcomes of current events and future reality of the coming Messiah. So just oftentimes they would very practically, like I was saying, they would speak to a people at a time and they would say, this is what's gonna happen in your generation. Or, uh, you know, they would prophesy, you're gonna be, we're all gonna be taken out by Babylon for 70 years. And, and you know, it either happened or didn't happen and that verified the prophet. Then also what they would do is they would prophesy of the Messiah. And so we see Jesus show up and Jesus fulfills hundreds of prophecies that had been spoken about who the Messiah was gonna be and what the Messiah was gonna do for a thousand years prior to his coming. And when Jesus shows up, he fulfills those prophecies, marking him uh, for us to know that he is actually the Messiah. Okay, so these are generally the roles uh, of the Old Testament prophet. Are we good? Are you with me? Yeah. All right, let's continue. Number two, there was a strictness to the office in the Old Testament. Only certain people were called to be prophets and gifted in this way. And guess what the penalty was for prophesying incorrectly? There was a death penalty if a prophet 
turned people to other gods. You could see Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. It's really the only two chapters that really talk about this. Now, a lot of people know this fact and they quote this fact and they sometimes even in modern church today, they quote this reality that did take place in the Old Testament and they say things like, we, we need to be careful of the prophetic in the church today because there are false prophets. There are people that are speaking wrong. And, and if somebody speaks something and they say, oh, this is from the Lord or the Lord says, and then it's, it doesn't come true. Well, what do we know? Well, we know in the Old Testament, they had to die. Okay, well, that was true. But we also need to recognize that in both of these chapters, it was specifically... It was specifically about prophecy that was leading people away from God. And so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to present to you that people can just prophesy and get it wrong in the Old Testament. They couldn't. But we also just need to remember that the death penalty was really talking about prophets that would arise and speak on behalf of God. But what it was doing, it was steering them to other false gods. That was really the premise of this. But nevertheless, this was the consequences in the Old Testament. And so it was very specific in terms of who did it. It was very weighty, of course. And if you were a false prophet, they were to put you to death, okay? Number three, prophecy in the New Testament and in the modern era church also has a specific purpose and it's different. And I'm gonna show it to you from the scripture. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, three, we read this. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. This verse right here is the primary verse from which we get the purpose of modern, current, New Testament church prophecy, okay? So the framework is this. God had a covenant with his people in the Old Testament. And the fulfillment of that covenant when it was when he was gonna step out of heaven and show up, the Messiah was gonna come and establish a new covenant. So Jesus shows up, fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. He establishes the new kingdom through his death, burial, and resurrection. He ascends to heaven and says, wait in Jerusalem for I'm gonna send my spirit. And in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes, fills all of the believers fills all of the believers with his spirit, which is not something that really took place in the Old Testament. You gotta get this. This is why there's a difference in the New Testament from the Old. In the Old Testament, the spirit of God, we sang about it, the spirit of God was, uh, was dwelling in the Holy of Holies where the ark was. This is why we just sang about David honoring the ark of the covenant because the ark of the covenant is where the presence of God was. But in the New Testament, after Jesus establishes the church, where's the presence of God now? In us. His spirit is in us. And so if the spirit of God and the power of God and the voice of God is in a believer who's sealed and filled with his spirit, then what ought we expect from the believer? That they will in some way, shape or form operate in the overflow or manifestation of that spirit. Are you with me? And so we are able to prophesy today and I'm gonna show you a little bit how that works in a moment, but I want you to see that these three things are the primary way that prophets are to prophesy or people are to operate in the gift of prophecy today. So edification is the word to build up. And we've already seen, and we see all throughout scriptures that all spiritual gifts are not for us and for our glory. The fact that I am gifted to preach is not so you guys can think, wow, you're such a great preacher. Everything we do, and you have your own gifts. And if you think you don't, you do. The Holy Spirit's distributed to each one of us according to his will for the building up of the church that, that men might see our good deeds and give glory to our Father in heaven. So if you wanna know if you're operating in your gifting correctly, look at the wake of your life. And if people are honoring you, praising you and not praising God, you're missing it. But if they're seeing your good deeds and their eyes are turned to God, then that's exactly what he wants. But they're all meant for the building up, the edifying 
of other people. Number two, for the exhortation, this word in its essence is to, to speak and try to persuade somebody to do something on behalf of God. That's what that word means. And number three, comfort is literally the same word as the name of the Holy Spirit where we see Jesus call him. It's called the, he's called the paraclete, which means the helper or the comforter. That's the name of the Holy Spirit. When, when Jesus says, I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna send the paraclete, who's the helper or the lawyer or the comforter. And so what we are to do when we prophesy is literally to overflow in the same way, encouraging and comforting people with the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because that's all that prophecy is, is speaking from the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's continue. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So again, it's for upbuilding of other people. What then brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, and let all things be done for the building up. Just want to add more evidence, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that all gifts are meant for the building up of other people. Now watch this. Now you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Okay, so is it pretty well established that that the gift of prophecy is to build up and to encourage other people? Amen. Okay, point number four. We're gonna fly through these. Perfection, listen, perfection is not an absolute sign in the New Testament and modern church. This is important to understand because again, there are many people, even good Bible teachers that don't fully understand the gifting nor, or, or have experienced the gifting that, that base New Testament or modern prophecy on Old Testament standards. They're not the same. Watch this. Here's a few. Let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what is said. We're supposed to be weighing. We're all supposed to be weighing what it is that we're hearing, testing it and seeing, okay? Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold to what is good. So why would there be a testing if the assumption is every single word and syllable that comes out of somebody's mouth is absolutely perfect? It's different than the Old Testament. It's not that there's just a few people and they, they really are the only representation of the truth and the voice of God in this, in this generation. No, no, no. The New Testament, we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we would expect that the Holy Spirit is gonna come out of every single one of us for the building up of the church and different manifestations. We would expect that he would reveal himself through every one of us in different ways. And so what we need to do is use discernment, testing and weighing to discern what it is that is coming out of somebody else and whether that is from God and for our benefit. Okay, so we are to test. So next weekend when you show up and you hear the prophets speak and you think to yourself, well, I don't know if that's, I don't know. It's okay, test it, weigh it, have conversations. Hey, did you relate with that? Did you, re did you resonate with that? Oftentimes when we get a prophetic word, we'll go to our, our circle and we'll say, hey, what did you think of that? You know, I don't know if that resonated with me. And oftentimes we've received words that really resonated. And sometimes we're like, nah, I don't know if I resonate with that. But watch this. Sometimes you get a word in one season and you're like, that makes zero sense. And I think you missed it. But years later, it comes to pass exactly. Let me just testify to you. Sean Bowles prophesied over Jessica and I in 2018. If you don't know who Sean Bowles is, he's a renowned international prophet. We were at an event. He brought us up on stage, 5,000 people. And he said, hey, what we're gonna do, because it was a prophetic training event. He goes, we're gonna have somebody run around with a microphone and everybody can test their prophetic words on you. So he's like, everybody pray and see if you can hear from God. And then we're just gonna run around. And then they, people, random people would say, hey, I, I felt this or I saw this. And they would submit a word to us in front of everybody. And we'd be like, yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's on or no, sorry, I don't, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. And it was just like training people to hear. And we did that for like 15 minutes and then we're getting ready to walk down. And then Sean goes, oh, hey, let me tell you what I saw before, before you sit down. And he goes, I just see like your online real estate is growing. Whoa. And 
This is exactly what he says. He goes, I just, I, I sense that like, you're gonna start doing trainings, just even like maybe just a few minutes at a time. And God is gonna take what is micro and make it macro. And God is gonna take what's in Coeur d'Alene and send it all over the world. And we were like, okay, cool. I don't know. Uh, you missed it. And if you don't know what I do now, I post about 900 videos a year, have about 2 million followers online, and we reach, uh, uh, like, the 2023, we had 57 million views online, all from my studio. But, but watch this. I didn't start doing that because of the prophetic word. I forgot about it. I lit we literally forgot that he prophesied that about us. And then when I was a year into online ministry, I thought to myself, I think that Sean Bowles prophesied this. And I went back and found a video of it. And I was like, he said this. And so sometimes just be careful, be careful with your judgment because sometimes they come to pass later. And that's a beautiful thing. So I would just encourage you, if you ever get a prophetic word from somebody, try and record it, try and document it and save them. I have them all in a Google sheet and I have them all on YouTube unlisted so I can save them forever. Anyway, let's continue. For we know in part, and watch this, we prophesy in part. We don't know everything. We see through a glass dimly. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face when we see God in heaven in glory. Now I know in part, in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so once again, I just want to, prophecy now is we don't have the full picture sometimes, okay? Let's continue. I'm sorry, I'm running behind. Whoever's on worship, you could come and join me. I'm gonna try and get through these real quick. Point five, we're halfway through. I got three minutes left. <laughs> Are you getting something out of this though? Yes. Good. Some prophecy is conditional, if then. Some prophecy is absolute. Okay, so we also have to know when we're testing, weighing, or judging prophecy um, that, so like, for example, somebody came to Elijah and wanted to be healed. Elijah says, go and dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. And he was like, that's so stupid. I got good water where I'm from in Syria. And he starts leaving and his, and his servant was like, hey, we're already here. You want to just try it? And he had leprosy. And he's like, fine, I'll try it. And he goes in the water and he dips seven times and he's healed. But guess what? Even though the prophet Elijah said it, if he wouldn't have done it and he left, he would not have been healed. That's called an if-then prophecy. So if you were to look at Elijah and be like, you're a false prophet, he wasn't healed. No, I told him to dip seven times. And if he doesn't do it, he's not gonna get it. And so we see this over and over and over again. The prophets are like, hey, you guys need to repent or Babylon's gonna take you out. They didn't repent and so it happened. And so listen next weekend or in gen whenever you get prophecies in general, listen if God is saying, I want you to do this or that. And if he says that, you should probably try doing this or that. But there are other things that it's just kind of like, it's not, it's not on you. You're not going to make it happen. You're not going to manufacture it. It's just, that's going to be God's providence. It's going to take place or not. So notice that there's a difference and listen for them. Point six, there are three general forms of prophecy in the New Testament. Okay. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and future declarations. Um, and so quickly, this is what it means. So if somebody like receives a word of knowledge about you, that might mean that they hear something about your life that's information that they would not have known other than if the Holy Spirit spoke it to them. So I just want to say a few things about this. Number one, if you're concerned that like all of your trash is going to be put out on the carpet for everybody in the world to see, that's not what's going to take place. But prophecy does speak to the secrets of men's hearts. And so there is something to a word of knowledge that's powerful, but really a word of knowledge is just to establish the credibility of the prophet or the prophetic word, typically so that the word of wisdom or insight can follow and you'll receive it. The words of knowledge are, are oftentimes the things that we're like, whoa, how did you know that I'm a OBGYN? Cool. But then it's like, what does that matter? They knew that but it's what comes next. So word of knowledge, word of wisdom is like, they, they've, been, they've, been got, they've received some kind of information from God that's wisdom for you to, to do something with it. And then 
uh, future declarations is like, this is what's gonna happen. Like what Sean did, said about us. Is, this is what's gonna take place and it did, okay? There are three divisions of prophetic ministry in the New Testament. Here we go. There's what we would call momentary grace, or you could say the spirit of prophecy. And that's this, that every single one of us, if you're born again, if you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that means at any given time, based on the providence and the will of God and the Holy Spirit, He can, in a moment, fill you with a prophetic utterance, any of us. So I just, I wanna make that clear. If, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you can hear from God and you could speak from God. It, and he could choose to do that some, and he, he will choose to do that sometimes, but not always. And, and if you get to the end of your life and, and that's never happened through you, that's okay. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants to operate other ways in you, but it is possible for him to have, show up through you in momentary grace or for the spirit of prophecy to fall. The second one would be the gift of prophecy. That is people that, that typically operate in this specific gift. Okay, so like I don't typically operate in the gift of singing on key. Like it's not the gift that I typically operate in, although sometimes or never, but, um, but there are other people that that's how they normally operate, right? That's the same with, with prophecy. And then there's something that we would call the office of a prophet or somebody that is a prophet, like that's who they are. And that would be in some ways similar to the Old Testament. And this one is the one that we try and bring in for the sound, just so you know. Somebody that's proven for years to be accurate in general and speaking truth and building up the church. Those are the three sort of divisions you could say. Point number eight, love must be the motivation always. First Corinthians 13. Point number nine, we ought to desire to do it. Remember the scripture said we ought to desire their spiritual gifts, especially that we might prophesy. prophesy. And point number 10, uh, oh, here we go. Well, yeah, that's what I just quoted. Here we go. Point number 10, prophecy should be normal in the church. Okay, if, if the Holy Spirit has filled us and the gifts have never ceased, that God still desires for the church to be built up through every gift, it's like, it's interesting because we show up every weekend believing that through a man and a microphone preaching the word of God that you'll actually hear not from a man, but from God. We believe in that gift and we believe in other gifts. We ought to also believe in the gift of prophecy and speaking in tongues, the gifts of healing and deliverance and things like that. And so in this church, we are going to desire the spiritual gifts and we're gonna pursue them. And we're always going to attempt to employ them in a healthy, godly and biblical way. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Are you fully equipped? Um, it's the last thing I wanna say. And then I just wanna give an invitation to anybody that's in the room that doesn't know Jesus. And then we gotta close. When I showed up in 2012, I was a skeptical person. I was a rogue theologian. When I was dating my wife, my wife now Jessica, when we were dating, we would, we would visit other churches. And at one point we were dating, she goes, I'm not, I'm not gonna visit any other churches with you. I'm tired of it. All you do is rip everything that you hear, whether it's the preaching or the worship or how they did this or the greeting team, or you just have something that's off about everything because I was just theological, 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 like judging, critiquing, is that biblical, all this. Like if I went into a church and I heard somebody speaking in tongues on a microphone, I would, I would leave so furious because my framework was there needs to be an interpretation, you know? And I just was casting so much judgment. But by about 2010, the Lord had got a hold of me and I knew I was just not submitted under authority. And, and I knew that God said two things to me, Craig, you need to be under authority, specifically J.O. And there's more to the Holy Spirit that you don't have that I want for you. And so I tentatively stepped into this community and it was the first spirit-filled charismatic community that I experienced personally that wasn't weird. It was like, it was a people that really believed that God is still alive today, but they weren't acting out of order and they weren't being weird about it. And they weren't trying to manipulate people. And it wasn't all about money. And it wasn't all about one man's glory. It was just about a people, a hungry people that wanted to see God move today the way he did back then. 
So I stepped in and I said, God, if this is actually from you, I want it. But if it's man-made and manufactured and manipulating, and I want nothing to do with it. And so that first sound in 2012, I stood at the back of the sanctuary and I like leaned against the, the door in the back because at that time, the nursery was literally in the sanctuary. So I like was watching my kid who was like right back here. And I'm, I'm watching the prophet at the front and I'm skeptical, but my heart is like, God, if it's from you, I want it. But if it's man-made, I want nothing to do with it. And, and at that first meeting, the prophet goes from, from, the back, from the front, he's looking at me in the back, he goes, this is for you. And I was like, okay, buddy, bring it. <laughs> we'll see if this is generic, you know? And then he starts speaking some things that were like personal. I was like, whoa. And by the end of that weekend, all of the prophets had an opportunity to speak over me. And they were all speaking things that were personal to my heart that there's no way that they would have known. And this is how God got me to seal it off the cherry on top. One of the prophets is coming this next weekend, our sort of pastoral oversight, Bob McGregor. He puts his hand on my shoulder in front of the whole church. And if you know his voice, oh, you'll hear it next week. And he goes, Craig, you've said in your heart, if it's from God, you want it. And if it's from man, you want nothing to do with it. Well, God wants you to know it's from him. So get on board. It's a word of knowledge. It's a word of wisdom. It, it speaks to the secrets of my heart and God got me. And listen, you can hear a thousand sermons that are good and beneficial to you, but when God speaks directly to you, directly to you, one time it changes everything. And that's the beauty of prophecy. So I hope that you'll embrace it in general and I hope that you'll come specifically next weekend.